Welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Dan Howe. In 2017, Libraries Today tried to highlight the different kinds of libraries across West Virginia. School libraries, academic libraries, special libraries, and more. We traveled to many parts of the state, from the eastern panhandle to the central coal fields to the farmlands of Greenbrier County. Let's take a look back at libraries today in 2017. There are more school libraries in West Virginia than any other kind. Schools are the introduction for many of us to the magic of a library. In our August episode, we talked about school libraries with a Charleston school librarian, another from Upshur County, and a specialist in school libraries from Marshall University. Let's talk a little bit about school libraries. Typically, we focus on public libraries. Today, we're taking a little different view and see how school libraries operate and how they, they differ from public libraries. From your perspective, being someone I know who has gone into the library in a public library setting and also is uh, running a school library, what do you see as the biggest differences? I don't know that there's a difference as um, much as this just a different approach. Mm -hmm. The goal for all is, of course, reading. Mm -hmm. You go to the library to read. We want our children to read. Um, a lot of the things that we do in the library is not just about reading, but maybe a jump-off point to produce reading. Mm -hmm. We do some robotics. We set goals for personal reading achievement. We play with Legos, mm -hmm. and those Legos then lead to story writing. There's more. We encompass a little more in the library than the public library because we have standards that we have to meet. It's also a teaching environment. Absolutely, yes. Which is a little different from a public library as well. Yes, we do way more than just check out. Uh, as you look down the road, what kind of changes do you see in the future for school libraries? Well, the library is always a peaceful place, and the children seem to enjoy the library because they they always get to go on a little adventure even when we're reading books or watching books on the smart board or whatever we're doing that day it takes them away for that amount of time that they can insert themselves as opposed to always being <laughs> spoken to <laughs> and that's something i think it, i think we can agree as we look at libraries today and in the future that's never going to change. I think kids will always like coming to the library. Here in Morgantown, we are corralling some school librarians to talk about the differences between school libraries and public libraries. With me now is Angie Westfall from Buchanan Upshur High School. Angie, thanks for being with us. Thank you for having me. And one of the differences between uh, public libraries and school libraries is that you have a dual role. Mm -hmm. Not only are you a librarian, you're also a teacher. Yes. Um, so, do you consider yourself more of a teacher or more of a librarian? Um, I think I'm always a teacher first, mm -hmm. and the library is a place for people to come in and gain access to resources and, of course, books and mm -hmm. hang out, but there are always teachable moments no matter where you're at. I suppose it would be a, it's a real balancing act, I guess, when you're doing that. Yes. Um, whether it's teaching freshmen when they come into the library about where things are located mm -hmm. and doing scavenger hunts, um, getting them to check books in, explaining policies about returning items, uh, you have that. At the same time, you may have a class in for research skills and um, using some of the West Virginia mm -hmm. Library Commission's uh, resources. Where does technology fit in down the road in school libraries? Um, knowing how to use technology in a correct manner, um, knowing where those boundaries are, um, different apps and programs and just what's available to them. We have uh, 
kids can come in and they can use computers for research. They can create projects. They can do, we have spheros. And so they can do coding. Angie, appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. So thank you for having me. And with me now is Dr. Kimberly McFall of Marshall University. Dr. McFall, thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Now, you run the school library program at Marshall, correct? That is correct. I guess your role is to educate people to become school librarians. That is correct. So I've talked to an elementary school librarian and a high school librarian. Okay. How do you approach, when you're in teaching, how do you approach the differences between the two? Well, what's interesting is that no matter what grade level that students are in, um, they really collaborate with each other. So what we do is we take one concept or one topic and we break it down into how kindergarten students are going to learn this and how seniors are going to learn it. When I was a student, uh, pleasure reading for me in the library was the most important thing. And I, you know, I studied in there and that sort of thing, but I loved going into the library and picking up books. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that has to be a big part of what, what you guys do. Well, it is um, really exposing kids to different genres and, you know, different things. What's the future of school libraries? You know, that's, that's a tough one because funding is certainly an issue. And I feel like the future of school libraries needs to be they need to be the hub of the school. They need to be collaborating. Those libraries need to be collaborating with school um, teachers, the classrooms, the administrators, the community. Um, it needs to be a place where people can come in and be connected to other things. And just because a lot of things are going digital doesn't mean that libraries are outdated because we are keeper of the information. We're not keeper of pages. Dr. McFall, thanks for being with Thank us. Thank you for having me. School libraries are a place where students learn. They learn about specific subjects. They learn to research. They learn how to navigate in a world of information. And maybe most importantly, what they learn is the love of reading. Academic libraries are typically housed in colleges and universities. They're designed with two primary goals, to support the school's curriculum and to support research by faculty and students. In our September episode, we paid a visit to one of the state's outstanding academic libraries on the campus of Marshall University. I know I spent a lot of time on this campus as an undergraduate. And the library that I spent my time in, very different from the Drinko Library. It's very different. It, it is really great to be in a profession that's changed so dramatically in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, but yes, we still have the old library, which is the Morrow Library. And in that library, we house our federal government depository and also our special collections. The historian in me has to talk a little bit about uh, the Civil War Museum that we're s currently standing in, and also the Chuck Yeager room, which was also very impressive. Yes. Well, we are very fortunate that the, that the family of Chuck Yeager and, and he provided us um, wonderful artifacts, including the nose cone of when he broke the sound barrier and some of his personal papers that will be available at some point in the future. Um, for this collection, we have um, probably uh, one of the renowned collections that uh, concentrate on the history of the Civil War so that students can write theses, uh, contribute to dissertations, and produce other important scholarly works dealing with that important time in our history. And the other thing I'll, I'll mention briefly is uh, this is an old library of mine, so when I came in here it's changed completely from what it was uh, uh, 20 years ago. It really has. Um, there have been two major renovations of this space and while the front of it still kind of looks like it looked in 1926-29, the inside is completely updated. In this building, the John D. Verdrinko Library, we consider it more of the um, main undergraduate library. We house general collections and we have our instruction program located here and also um, our journals, current journals. Well, Dr. Brooks, why don't you show me around uh, the Drinko Library? Sure thing. It's first floor. This is where mm -hmm. circulation and our research services mm -hmm. are located. Also, the Learning Commons, which is a combination of some of our popular reading mm -hmm. material and also study areas, including some study rooms and an area that is actually open 24 hours, um, several days a week, which mm -hmm. is great. 
In the back we have our IT services desk and also the ID office and um, we have current newspapers and some DVDs so that students can use those if they need them. Okay. Now this is the first floor, a lot of activity obviously here on this yes. floor, but there are three other floors in this library as That's well. That's right. Uh, on the second floor we have a writing center and also an instructional design center for online learning. There's also a quiet study area, reading room, and that's also a great place for students to get work done. Computers throughout the building, including on the third floor, where the bulk of our collection is located. I noticed on the third floor there were a number of study rooms. Well, I guess folks could go in, close the door, do what they need to do. That's right. All of our floors except the fourth floor have study rooms, and students can actually log into our web page and reserve those themselves. What's on the fourth floor? The fourth floor is the computing services area, the hub of our telecommunication system and all the computers that are running everything at Marshall. All on the fourth floor. <laughs> yes, <laughs> in a, a very secure location. <laughs> so are students allowed in that general area? It's really not a, a public area, mm -hmm. but um, we do give tours occasionally so they can see what's happening. Okay. When we come back, we'll look back at more of Libraries Today in 2017. Looking back at libraries today in 2017. Thanks for being with us. So far, we've visited school libraries and academic libraries. But West Virginia has another category of libraries called special libraries. Special libraries are found in a wide variety of places, ranging from medical centers to law libraries to historical societies. One of the most fascinating of these special libraries can be found at the Capitol Complex in Charleston. In our October episode, we paid a visit to the State Archives and History Library. With me now is Archives and History Librarian Susan Scores. Susan, thanks for being with us. Well, thank you for coming to visit us. So tell me about the mission of this library. The West Virginia Archives and History Library is the way the public accessions the collections of the West Virginia State Archives. Uh, the contents of this library and the archives belong to the people of the state of West Virginia. And uh, most of the collections are not something that most people would be able to uh, interpret or, or find what they want by themselves. So the library and its staff are the way that people access the collections. Describe your collections for me. Archives in the library collect everything by and about West Virginia and West Virginians. Now, quite obviously, we can't hold all of that. Our space is limited, but we do our best to, uh, to call out the most vital things and uh, save them for the future. Describe the process that patrons, historians, researchers would use to access the collection here. Um, the simplest way is to walk in the door. Uh, we're ready to, to help, and we have a wide variety of experience and knowledge on our staff, including uh, knowledge of specific collections, but um, we have um, an online catalog and we retain an old card catalog, but that's basically because it's built into the wall, so <laughs> it's still there, but uh, you can search the catalog online to see what we have before you come. There are also various finding aids for the different collections that are searchable on the computer. We still have the old notebooks on paper with the same information, but uh, it's very handy for people to see what we have and plan their research before they come. Susan, this is a large library. I believe it takes up four floors of the Culture Center here in Charleston. We're in the reading room. Can you give us a tour of this facility? Sure. So Susan, uh, show us around the reading room. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned before, the library includes the most used parts of the collection. We have family history books. We have transcriptions and indexes of county records. Uh, we have some information for the states that adjoin West Virginia because any place there's a bridge or a place to uh, ford the stream, people are mm -hmm. going to go back and forth over it over the mm -hmm. years. We have, uh, of course, a heavy emphasis on the Civil War, Civil War history, mm -hmm. the men who fought the war, and different ways to research that information. Mm -hmm. And we have a large collection of 
county histories, sometimes of an individual town, but mostly county histories. Publicly accessible computers over here. And we have examples here of both our older microfilm machines and of the newest technology, which are digital film mm -hmm. viewers and scanners. And we have an additional room in the back that is uh, full of different types of readers and also houses our microfilm collection. A lot of information in this room, but this is just the tip of the, top of the iceberg, right? This is the publicly accessible part. Uh, there, as you said, there are three other levels where there's, uh, you know, all different types of collections. One of the state's best kept secrets, the State Archives and History Library in Charleston. Sometimes libraries come in small packages, but these small rural libraries can carry a big punch, such as the Gilmer Public Library, which we visited in our June episode with Interim Director Patrick Montgomery. Patrick, thanks for being with us today. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you for coming out. So you're new to the leadership position here. What are you looking for from the library development staff when they come and pay you a visit? Well, so far, from the dealings that I've had with the library commission staff, um, I've had nothing but support from everything. So I'm looking for a continuance of that, which I'm sure I'll get. Um, but right now I'm looking for support of kind of future-proofing ideas, which is the new thing with libraries is try and kind of future-proof yourself, make sure that you're ready for any available outcome, um, make sure that your tech is as up-to-date as possibly it can be and that your people are getting what they deserve. So with uh, the programming updates, that would be what I would be looking for. I would think with you know, being a smaller library, mm -hmm. limited staff, mm -hmm. that the role the WVLC Library Development Department mm -hmm. plays for you has got to be pretty significant. It is. It is a very, very huge role that they uh, they play here with us, and we absolutely appreciate everything that they have done and continue to do for us. I guess training is going to be something that's uh, important to you and your staff as well. Oh, very much. I want to make sure that everyone is ready for any possible outcome because, you know, every five seconds there's something new that we have to learn, which is the great part of working in a library. And um, with that, I want to make sure that everyone here has every possible opportunity to be as trained as possible. You're not exactly the new kid in town because you've been here a while. Yeah. But you're the new sheriff in town. Yes. Right? So uh, what are your goals for what is now your library? My goals are definitely expansion. Um, I want to make sure that our community is so amazing. Without their support, we would not be able to do a single thing that we do. They are the reason that we get up and come in the morning here. And I want to make sure that they get everything that they deserve. So within the next few years, I do want to look at expanding the building to better suit their needs, to be able to offer them more programming, more services, more things that they see fit that would make this community a better place for them. You're viewing the library really as a community center. Oh, 100 percent, because I believe that in 2017, they have to be to survive. I don't think you can subsist as surely about books anymore. I think that you have to be community driven and have that kind of support, especially with, you know, what we're facing in potential budget cuts around mm -hmm. the nation. In a, a town like Glenville and a, a county like Gilmer, uh, I believe this is, is this the only library in, in the county? Public library, yes, yes. but uh, uh, Columbus State College actually has a library up there as well. Right. Yes. So you, you get a, your library serves not only Glenville, mm -hmm. But the whole county. We serve the county. We also serve, um, even though there are libraries in some other counties, we have a large number of patrons from other counties as well who drive all the way here. Because for us, like I said before, which is probably terrible to hear a librarian say this, but for me, it's not about the book. It's about the people. That's what we give our people, our services. You know, a library is not about books. A library is a promise to its community. And that's our philosophy here is that we're promising the enduring support of our community. We'll continue our look back at libraries today in 2017 after this. Share your heart. Share your love. Make a shelter pet part of your world. Welcome back to our look back at 2017 on libraries today. During the past year, we wanted to show you different types of libraries. In November, we visited the Hamlin-Lincoln County Library System to see how a small library system interacted with its branches. Library Director Margaret Smith 
and branch manager Linda Pritchard gave us a tour. So, Mark, I want you to show us around. Okay. This is the circulation desk. And you were saying this desk was made specifically for the library when it opened? It was, and they had a dickens of a time getting it in here. <laughs> I can see that. It was handcrafted by C.E. Mundy, who used to be the mayor of Hamlin. Here's our periodical section. Okay. And what's, uh, what's all this right here? We have a craft class that's attended mostly by elderly women, and mm -hmm. um, one of them made these doll clothes for it, um, and we displayed them there. And, and here is a tie quilt that one of them made. She made them out of her daddy's ties. <laughs> How neat. Okay. This is the children's area. We have um, easy books over on this wall, and these are nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Of course, we have tables for our kids when they come in with the classes. With some of the classic books there. Right. <laughs> these are um, audio books. Mm -hmm. This is the juvenile nonfiction, mm -hmm. and we have juvenile fiction and young adult fiction here okay. in this area. Adult yeah. fiction goes back that way. This is adult nonfiction here. My favorite section. Uh huh. <laughs> Back in this corner is local history. And we have um, things on the wall from Chuck Yeager, who is, is uh, one of our proud sons. This is his hometown. Right. And this outfit here was uh, um, used by um, Mr. Vandalin, who was um, a local celebrity. Mm hmm. I see, a, I see a photo of him marching in a parade with that outfit. Right. So what is this room, Margaret? This is our original computer room when we first opened the library, but we had to expand out into the uh, main part of the library. How many computers do you have here now? We have eight, I believe, um, that are, are public access, and when, then we have a child's computer <laughs> that's not public access. So what do we have here? This is a meeting room, and it's used extensively. We have a lot of community meetings and a lot of programming down here. I understand you have an amphitheater as well. We do, and it's not used as much as I wish it was. For you, what's the uh, biggest advantage of being a branch library? The freedom that I have, um, I really like that. I did work at the main library before doing this, and I enjoyed that tremendously. And I always had helpers, you know. I wasn't alone, so I didn't have to do everything all the time by myself. But, and that's a challenge here, but the freedom that I have here to be in tune with what people need, you know, I can prioritize my day the way I see fit and um, my uh, the administrator Margaret Smith she is very good about you know leaving me giving me that chance to just do what needs to be done. The Martinsburg Public Library System is located in the fastest growing county in West Virginia and now serves more than 100,000 people. In our December episode we took the long road north and drop by the Martinsburg Library and its three branches. Uh, what, what kind of role does your library play in this community? Um, well, a, a number of things. We, of course, we bridge the digital divide. There's a, a large uh, number of people who uh, don't have internet access or um, for various reasons. Um, and we provide computers. We provide uh, free wireless service for people. Um, so that's a, a big thing. Uh, we, of course, provide a, a community meeting space. So we have um, meeting rooms for people to, uh, they can sign up and meet here. Um, we provide educational programs for children, particularly um, in the summer. Um, a lot of times, uh, that we, we're one of the few places that provide free uh, activities for kids. And of course, the purpose of summer reading is to keep kids 
reading throughout the summer so that their um, that their uh, scores don't slip, their uh, reading scores don't sl slip, because a lot of times over summer, a lot of studies have shown that kids' reading scores will slip over the summer if they don't have, um, if they don't continue to read over the summer. You have a program going on today with, uh, with kids. We do, we do. We have a um, preschool story time, which, um, and, uh, which is a, a monthly, uh, I'm sorry, a weekly event. Um, and actually all four of our libraries provide uh, story times for kids. Um, as well as a number of, of other activities. Um, one of the other things that we do, uh, which we've started doing, is actually doing more uh, STEM programming, which is uh, science, technology, engineering, math programming. Um, we are uh, currently working on developing a, a STEM lab. It's actually under construction right now at our library, um, and um, we're hoping to get that up and running. Um, and um, of course, the uh, North Berkeley, um, I'm sorry, Hedgesville actually also has uh, their level up programs they have on Mondays. We average about 30 programs a week for children, or, or month, sorry, 30 programs a month for children and um, about two or three programs for adults a month. We get about 250 kids per month. Um, that's low end, probably about 300 to 400 high end, depending on what our programming is. On Mondays, we offer the same program at one, three, and five. It's STEM-based, or I should say STEAM-based, because we do have art programs in there as well. And I, I guess here, uh, growing part of, well, all of the county's growing, and uh, new high schools just down the road, uh, right? So it's, it's really, uh, a really growing county, and how does that affect the library? We have given out probably over 100 new library cards in the past month. Oh, wow. Yes. Wow, that's great news. So what kind of programs do you offer? We do a once-a-week preschool story time. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting ready to do our annual fall festival with our catapult. Catapult? Catapult. You have a catapult. We have a catapult. Okay, tell me about the catapult. Well, we have pumpkins donated from local farm markets, and we load them in our catapult and launch them. And then we'll have activities and crafts inside as well. We hope you've enjoyed our look back at 2017. And we hope we gave you a solid look at the varied libraries that allow West Virginians to enjoy a good book or a good movie or a good internet experience. We'll be back in 2018 with more programs on libraries and library life in West Virginia. I'm your host, Dan Howe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.